Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Robert Rayburn here at Life Pro Asset Management. It is September 16th of 2024. Glad everyone could join. Now, the good news is we're halfway through the month of September. Seasonally, this is the month that is the weakest from a historical standpoint. Now, the good news is the closer that we get to the end of September and the first two weeks of October, the closer we get to what is uh, historically known as the seasonally strongest period of the market, right? So going from that mid-October time period through to the end of the year, capping the market rally, the historic market rally with the Santa Claus rally, as it's otherwise known in the month of, of December. So why does that happen? We don't really know. Uh, a lot of it does have to do with the summer lull. People come back, people want to take risk off the table because they don't know what's going to be reported in some of that data. The other thing is, you know, Q4 does involve Christmas, which is the peak consumption time of the U.S. economy. And people are wrapping up those calendars for the end of the year. They do some window dressing and they being portfolio managers. So there's a whole bunch of different reasons why this happens. Obviously, the U.S. government does try to goose the economy going into an election. That's another conspiracy theory out there. That's, I would say, one of the more valid conspiracy theories out there when you look at the spending data. But let's go ahead and get started. Uh, after a brutal two weeks to start the month, we had a really you know, we had a decent week last week. And so the title of this week's presentation is bouncing into the month of October. We're going to go through three big things this week. Uh, we're going to assess the market conditions and what are some of those factors that are feeding the bounce. Number two, what are we expecting from the Federal Reserve this week? So, uh, you know, some people out there think we're going to get 25, some other are going to get 50. We'll go through whether or not 25 or 50 matters and what we expect the impact on the market to be. Lastly, uh, we do want to sort of use this current rate environment to lock in some of that lower risk income. We're going to talk about the impact that interest rates have on annualized income projections, both from a one and 10 year standpoint, because when we're putting an income plan together, we want to look at not just the next year, but the next 10 years and beyond. Now, I'm going to apologize ahead of time. I am battling a little bit of a head cold. So if I sound a little bit strange, that is the that is the reason why. So S&P 500, uh, here's the good news, ladies and gentlemen. We pulled right back about 5%, about a 5% pullback, and it was a violence. And if you were in what we call more beta-oriented sectors or more growth-oriented sectors, that pullback was probably closer to 10%. But what we saw here is we pulled right back into that 100-day moving average. This is the support that we were looking for when we look at the last couple of weekly updates, and we bounced right off that support, right? So now challenging sort of prior highs there. So big things here, we are challenging prior highs. The bounce has, uh, has been good breath, and it's been led by growth in some of the riskier parts of the market. So that is a good thing. If this was being led by utilities or by REITs, we would have some room for a pause. We did see uh, a shakeout of some of the bank stocks earlier in the week with JP Morgan commentary and then also data from Ally Financial. Uh, the good news is that when we look at the fintech names in particular, uh, they're reporting very good results. And if you think of where you would likely see some weakness in loan portfolios first, I've got to believe that the buy now, pay later names would be the first one to show those cracks. Uh, they tend to have lower average uh, credit scores and you tend to have lower annualized income uh, figures in, in that cohort of people that utilize the buy now, pay later. So overall, good action for the overall market. The other chart I wanna show here real quick is the Bitcoin weekly chart. So we have been building positions uh, in our growth portfolios in Bitcoin ETFs, Ethereum ETFs, as well as some of the miners. And what we really like about this particular asset class right now is that we think they're one of the prime beneficiaries of lower interest rates and by proxy, a lower US dollar. The second thing we really like is the, uh, not only did Bitcoin break out to a new high earlier in the year, but it's been a very methodical pullback into 
50-day moving average support. And we look at the weekly chart in particular, you can see how organized this pullback has been right into the prior pullback point. Um, and we would not be surprised to see a strong move in between now and the end of the year. Of course, we can be wrong, but um, that's is what we're seeing in the charts right now. Now, from a seasonality standpoint, we talked about this earlier. September stands out like a sore thumb. It is by far and away the worst performing month uh, when we look, when we look uh, behind sort of the last 50 years or so. September just stands out as that sore thumb. Now, the good news is when we chart the seasonality on an intramonth chart here, we can see here we start diving in August and into September and really sort of bottom out near the end of September. This big rally here is seasonally what Q4 looks like. The same way we don't really know the exact reasons why September always tends to be really choppy to the downside, can't give you real specific reasons as to why Q4 tends to be the same same way, but on the opposite side where things tend to rally, it's feel good, it's Christmas, right? There's portfolio window dressing taking place. All of that, uh, all of those play factors, um, but nevertheless, there's also that uh, if you hear it enough times, it becomes true, right? So uh, it has become market lower, that Q4 tends to be strong and you get the Santa Claus rally, so people start to chase. And you gotta remember at the end of the day, the stock market is a crowd. And crowds uh, don't necessarily follow logic all the time. And I think the big takeaway here, we whether we're talking about a weak September or a strong Q4, is that a lot of it is noise, right? So when you're looking at your financial plan with your advisor, just stick to your long-term plan. Don't get caught up in saying, hey, am I going to pull money out in the first week of September and then put it back in the second week of October? Or am I going to try and do a two or three week trade between uh, September and uh, the end of October. There's, there's no point because the one time that you try to do that, it'll be the one year that that doesn't happen. So really important to stick to that long-term plan, ignore the noise. Seasonality nevertheless does become a tailwind in October. So that's something we're watching. And the trend in rates are down, right? So that's the thing that we really wanna push out to our clientele base. The trend in rates are down. We're less concerned about whether the Fed does 25 or 50, and we'll go through why in a, in a minute. But the, the concern that we have is, are rates going up in general or down in general? And what are portfolios that historically tend to benefit in a non-recessionary environment when rates go up or down? And then applying that playbook as such. And in this case, as we know, rates are coming down, growth is slowing. We do not expect a recession, which is why we've had more of a growth tilt over the last two months. Again, going back to your advisor, there is a reason why I'm not your advisor, but that you have an advisor. The reason why you have an advisor is that advisor is your quarterback, right? Their job is not to try and manage portfolios around the five days, as we see here. It's to keep you on the path over this 5, 10, 15, 20-year time horizon. When we look at what happens to portfolio performance when you exclude some of the best days. You missed the 40 best days over the last 10 years, not 40 days per year, but just the 40 best days over the last 10 years. You go from 7.8% performance all the way down to minus 2.3. Missing just the top 10 days takes you down from 7.8% annualized performance all the way down to 4.1%. So it's just really critical that we try to ignore the noise and the shiny silver objects that the media throws our way. At the end of the day, during the grand scheme of things, the market has gone through Pearl Harbor, the Great Depression, World War I, World War II, uh, the great inflation of the 1970s, the Cold War, September 11th, both Gulf Wars, you name it, right? COVID. So we've just got, the market has a great way of taking value away from the impatient and ascribing it to the patient. Now, as it relates to the setup for the Federal Reserve this week, the good news is that inflation continues to ease. The overall inflation rate has now fallen to two and a half percent. Core is still around 3.2, but a lot of the factors that are keeping core up are, you know, things that 
we th we already see the leading indications that they're about to come back down, right? So we had a bounce in used auto prices, although used auto or uh, auto loan delinquencies were up. So we do expect those prices to return back to uh, to the disinflationary mode in September and October. The second thing, of course, is rents are still continuing to ease back. Um, and then the big thing, this is sort of the non-core, but oil prices, right? Oil prices continue to plunge. And that does have an impact across the board, not just on consumer dollars, but also it also has an impact on transportation costs. And what you ultimately see is the price that you pay for that product in the shelf. So a lot of us are trying to debate 50 or 25 basis points next week. Frankly, the bond market has already cut interest rates for the U.S. consumers. So what do we mean by that? Fed funds rate today, officially, when you watch this video, it's at 5.5%. The two-year yield, which tends to track the Fed funds rate, has already fallen from 5.2% a few months ago down to 3.57%, right? That means the market is already pricing in 163 basis points of rate cuts. So not 25, 50, 163 over the course of the rate cutting cycle. And if you remember, the last few weeks, we've talked about this neutral rate. The neutral rate is the rate at which the Fed believes, and the Fed can change their view anytime they want, uh, that the rate at which they believe neither contributes nor detracts from economic growth. And they believe that rate is right around 3 to 3.5%. Three so... The two-year yield being at 3.5% right now kind of jives in with what the Fed is thinking, and the market is merely front-running that. You've already seen mortgage rates drop quite a bit from over 8% to around, right around 6.5% right now. Now, we want that to go down a lot more. I know myself, with my mortgage and where it's at, I would love to see those mortgage rates continue to fall, but you're already seeing that benefit being passed along to the consumer, even though the Fed has not officially crystallized a rate cut as of today. And remember that rate cutting cycles historically do not tend to be one and done, okay? So when we think of our income portfolios and our income plans, and as we're approaching retirement and how we want to use our assets efficiently to generate and replace income that we were otherwise getting from our jobs or real estate or what other sources of income you were getting, interest rates are important. The same way they're important for your mortgage and how much cash is heading outside of your pocket to the banks is the same, but in reverse. We want to use periods of high interest rates to lock in income that are coming from bonds or other sources that are paid to us. So the more that we can lock in those high interest rates, the more money that ultimately locks in and is streamed into our wallets, right? So to kind of give you, a sh to show you the impact of that, a 25 basis point rate cut over uh, the course of a year on a million dollar portfolio will cost that client about $2,500, right? Not that big of a deal. Even over 10 years, about $25,000. But if you get, Four, three or four percent rate cuts, that becomes substantial. You're starting to talk about a hit to your income of between thirty and forty thousand dollars, but over ten years, three hundred to four hundred thousand dollars. For the average US consumer out there that has a million dollars in savings across their 401k, IRA, Roth, brokerage, et cetera, that is a lot of money. Okay, so four hundred thousand dollars over the course of 10 years, and of course you get five percent right, which would be a full retreat from where we were three years ago, that's $500,000 over 10 years. What is the message here? If you're looking at a diversified portfolio right now and you're saying, hey, you know what, I got probably too much in equities over the last, course of the last 15 years, I've just been accumulating, putting in a stock market. Now is probably a decent time that if you're in that retirement red zone or in retirement to say, you know what, I want to reduce my risk but at the same time, increase my income and lock in some of these higher interest rates. That can be done through bond strategies. We have an enhanced income strategy right now that has a yield to maturity between 8 and 9%. That's gross of fees, of course. Or you can look at something like a, an annuity, right, that takes those assets and ultimately crystallizes it and to generate some sort of lifetime income when you decide to annuitize that product. 
the point is our advisors are here to help. Uh, not everyone needs to do that. And it really comes down to whether or not it makes sense for you. So bottom line, ladies and gentlemen, is that September has definitely been volatile, but we are getting closer to a better seasonal time for the market. We do expect the Federal Reserve to cut 25 to 50 basis points uh, in the next week, uh, specifically on Wednesdays when they make that announcement. And we do think now is a good time of locking in higher rates. Uh, we do think that we're at the end of the high rate cycle. And when the Fed begins cutting, they often cut multiple times. So don't let this opportunity pass you by if you're looking for more income, if you're looking for low risk income, now's the time to look at your options. So that's what we got for you this week, 888-543-3776. Hope everyone's having a fantastic week so far. And again, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out and have a fantastic week. Thank you.